Thank you. My name is Marion Calmer, and I'm a farmer from Western Illinois. And first off, I want to say thank you to the Soybean Association for having me here. It's an honor to be here. Number two, I'd like to commend the Soybean Association on the name of this conference. And you notice that the word profitability is in the title. And I think that's really important. We always talk about being able to increase yields, but do we ever really sit down and become a businessman and do our pencil work and find out how profitable we really are? I've been farming since uh, the mid-70s, so I've been farming for 38 years. And in the middle 1980s, I met Herman Warsaw, and I took an inspiration to go home and start doing my own on-farm research. And so today, I own and operate the largest independent ag research center in the United States. I don't receive any funding from anybody to do the research. We run real farm machinery, run the length of the field, and we replicate several times. And you may or may not like what I have to say about what I've learned at my farm, but that's what I want to bring you today is the things I've learned at my farm. Maybe you'll take a little inspiration and go home and do some of these things at your own farm. And in the middle 1990s, after looking at multiple row spacings, I saw a significant yield advantage by growing corn in narrow rows. And so in 1995, I invented the world's first 15-inch corn head and have been growing corn in 15-inch rows and been working on corn heads ever since then. And then last year, maybe you've read some of the articles recently that have come out in the farm magazines. Currently, I think Farm Industry News has a story. I invented the world's first 12-inch corn head last year, and I'm looking at maybe moving on down to growing corn in 10-inch rows with a 10-inch seed space as we move into the future. So it's given me a lot of opportunities to talk to farm groups all across the country, all the way from Washington, D.C., down to the Gulf of Mexico, working on environmental issues. And so I'm going to start out with a quick little survey. Beans, I've talked to so many farm groups. How many of you are hearing me speak for the very first time or have heard me speak before? Raise your hand so I can see who you are. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. I always get a little nervous about the people that don't raise their hand, you know, when I ask that question. Hopefully we get 100% to audience uh, participation. Well, I, I do come from Illinois, and um, I'm about an hour north of Peoria, and about 30 minutes south of Moline on Interstate 74, and if you ever go north through Illinois, uh, by the Pioneer plant in Woodhall, I have a little combine sits alongside the road that's got one of our narrow corn heads on it. So that's where, about where I'm at. I've got silty loam soils. They're going to be dark in color. They're going to be cold in the spring, going to be wet. And, uh, but they're very, very productive soils as well. Now, being as I talk to a lot of groups around the country, um, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that Illinois has four very distinct and very unique characteristics that separate us from all the other states in the Union. And if you look on the west side of Illinois, you see the Mississippi River, and you see how it weaves around the state. So number one, Illinois is noted for its very crooked rivers. Number two, Illinois is noted for its very crooked oak trees. <laughs> and I don't be getting ahead of me now. <laughs> <laughs> and number three, Illinois is noted for its very crooked governors. <laughs> now, the, other, the fourth thing about Illinois is that our past four governors have all served two terms. First terms in office, second terms in jail. <laughs> so you can see I have a lot of fun with this as I travel around the United States and talk to farm groups. Now also from Illinois, of course, uh, is, is our current president, Barack Obama. And whether you voted for him or you didn't or you like him or you don't, I was born and raised to honor the presidency, and, and we have a great country, and so I always respect him. And it was an honor to meet him a couple years ago. I'm on the left side of the screen there about to shake his hand. Last summer, I got asked to go up and meet the vice president of the United States in Chicago. There was about 10 of us, and it was an honor to meet him. And just recently, in January, I received a phone call from Washington, D.C., and they have asked me to be one of the advisors to the Ag Committee that will be determining our next farm bill. So it'll be interesting to see the government side of, of what's going on. But I can tell you that the administration is very committed to alternative fuels, namely biodiesel and ethanol. So that means we as producers need to improve on what we're doing. 
And that brings me to one of my first points, is that we can't improve on things we don't measure. And at my farm, I probably have 300 and some research plots. But as you start to measure things, and, and I caution all of you as you read research data, is that if you're going to do something and, and measure it, I don't think you want to do it on a small scale. And if you're going to check gas mileage in this pickup truck, I don't think you're going to fill the tank, drive one block, and reload the tank and get a correct or an accurate gas mileage. You're going to load the tank and you're going to drive a couple hundred miles. So my opinion at my farm, I always like the larger plots. Uh, we always run the length of the field and that's how we get our accurate data. So I've been doing on-farm research since the middle 80s. Um, this is 1992, pictured there in the middle of the screen with my neighbors and my dad. And um, this is how we do this. Real farm machinery, we're going to run the length of the field, we're going to run multiple replications. So like I said, this is what happens at my farm, whether you like it or you don't, that's fine. And, and I've got some research booklets, if you want to take some home with you when you get done, we'll have some at our booth over here. And uh, hopefully you'll take some inspiration in what we do. So in breaking my own yield barriers, one of the first things I look at is no-till. Been pretty happy with it. Took me a while to get used to it. But once I figured out the secrets to making it work at my farm with my equipment, very profitable. Number two, we're going to talk about dry fertilizer. Everybody goes along and they buy phosphorus and potassium. But have you ever taken the time to find out if there's a profitable response to P and K. The example I make is if you were to take $100,000 and walk into the bank, would you just give it to the bank and not really ask about what kind of return you're going to get? No. You'd want to know what kind of interest rates you're going to pay you. And you'd want to come back the next year and you'd want to bring home $105,000 or, or something like that. You'd want to return on investment. Now remember back to the 80s, you know, we used to borrow $100,000. <laughs> And there was a time when the banker, if I'd offered him 85 or 90,000, I think he would have taken it back in the 80s. But you've got to remember, it, it, buying dry fertilizer is an investment. You want to see a return on it. Narrow rows. Uh, there's a certain number of people that are giving some thought to going back to 30 inch road soybeans. Buy larger planters, they can get it in the ground quicker. And I, I can't argue with that. But we're going to look at the actual reality of it, multiple replications. Seeding rates at my farm. I've been looking at this for several years, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I love the seeding industry, I love the fertilizer industry. At the end of the day, I'm going to be a businessman, I'm going to make some business decisions based on a return on investment. And last but not least, a little bit on residue management. Uh, as we grow soybeans, I'm finding out that my residue levels, especially when I'm no-tilling and especially when I'm in narrow rows, I've got more and more residue to deal with as I'm growing soybeans. So I want to talk a little bit about being able to deal with that. All right. So in the middle 80s, um, through the, through when I left college, um, I was a conventional tiller. And it was fun to see all the diesel smoke and sit out there in the tractor and listen to the turbo whistle. But at the end of the day, I really wasn't a very good environmentalist and I wanted to have a sustainable system and I bought this farm and after you buy it, you know, and then you want to make sure that the soil doesn't leave it as well as you don't want to see the water contaminated as well. So I started learning about no-till and started in the middle 80s uh, no-tilling uh, soybeans into corn stalks. Went really well. Um, learned a little bit about sidewall compaction and the number of cultures and I had to have weight on the planter and all of those kind of things and uh, eventually we got the system to work. But the, the thing about it was is that I didn't give up. As a travel around the United States, you know, you, you go into certain parts of the country. Well, no-till doesn't work. So here's another little tidbit of information. It comes from Henry Ford. <clears throat> Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So I believe at my farm I can make no-till work, and we do. And I hope that you always keep a positive attitude to whatever the new technology is that you may adopt as we move into the future. So then in 1995, of course, we went to 15 inch row corn and we started running row cleaner wheels. And you can see these are the Terratine row cleaner wheels. They're spring loaded 
And the secret is to be able to pull the residue out of one row without throwing it into the next row. And so um, you can adjust the angle and you can also have a fair amount of down pressure on them. And uh, so we're uh, raking all of the residue to the left in this particular picture and getting along really well. Once I got them set in about 1997 or 98, um, I haven't touched them. And they do a real nice job. They move residue, but not soil. They're spring loaded, never really have to work with them. So if everything goes well for you in no-till, this is what you'll see um, emerging up through the residue. And it's, it's a great cropping system. And I think this past year in the drought, <laughs> I think no-tilling was part of the reason I had some really nice soybean yields. And I'm not so sure that we weren't close to record soybean yields, even though we had a drought. They did really well in our part of the country. So hopefully you'll keep no-till as one of those things that helps you move to the next level as you increase your yields. Dry fertilizer. I've been to the Mosaic plant, I've visited with all the fertilizer people, been down in Mississippi, I've been to the Gulf of Mexico working on nutrient loading of the Mississippi River. My objective when I buy fertilizer is to make money with it. I want to spread it, I want to see a return on investment. I don't think that's asking too much. So this is a study that we did in 2012, uh, it happened to be in soybeans. Um, the, the bar on the left is without fertilizer, and those plots haven't had any P or K on them in the last 10, 11 years, I believe. We grew some 59 bushel beans. Pretty happy about that. Now, we do buy lime. Obviously, we're going to keep our pHs in balance. But in this plot, it hadn't been any P or K. It's in a corn-soybean rotation, and uh, 50, 59 bushel beans. The orange bar um, got $50 worth of P and K. And it also gets, uh, when it's in corn, that particular uh, group of plots also gets $100 worth of P and K when it's in corn. So I'm spending $50 and I'm picking up four bushels of soybeans. So depending on what you sold your beans for, it was kind of a break even kind of a deal. So um, I think here I figured uh, beans at $12 a bushel. So I spent 50 bucks and I got 48 back. Uh, maybe P and K has a multi-year effect. You could argue that statement. But basically, this doesn't tell me that I should or should not be putting fertilizer on. What it tells me is, is that I need to work on getting a better response. Maybe I need to adjust the amount of P or K. Maybe I need to adjust the way that I apply it. You know, I'm in a no-till system. I'm spreading it over the top. Maybe it would work better if I was to root zone band it. Um, all of those things are player. Maybe I need micronutrients. You know, there's a lot of factors. But again, if you don't, we, we can't improve on things we don't measure. And unless I had measured this, I wouldn't know this. So I'm trying to break my own yield barriers. Fertilizer's part of it. Just want to make sure I get a profitable response. Just quickly, how many grow beans in 15 inch rows? Pretty, it's, it's been pretty successful. Uh, John Kinzenbaugh is a buddy of mine, and I visited with John many, many years ago, and uh, kind of the founder of the 15 inch row market. So I'm going to break this up into two years, or, or two groups here. On the left side of the screen, we're going to talk about um, normal growing seasons. So that would be in 08 to 2011. And in those years, we compared 30 inch rows to 15 inch rows. Same planter, same variety of beans. And if, if we're going to run north and south with our research plots, uh, we apply any fertilizer, any lime, any tillage, anything that goes on is going to happen east and west so that we don't skew the data. So these plots run north and south, replicate four times. So um, there are four years there, so that's 16 replications that we've looked at at 30s versus 15s. In a normal growing season, my average response is going to be four bushel to the acre. And if you want to do the math on it, it's about a $48 an acre increase in profitability. So what happened last year during the drought? Was it a good thing to be in 15 inch rows or was it a bad thing to be during the drought? So on the right hand side of the screen is our 2012 study. The 30 inch rows, the orange bar there at 60 bushel to the acre. 
And our 15 inch beans went 66 bushels. So this is again, four replications. And if you do the math on it, that's $72 an acre. My statement at my farm under my management conditions. Under a normal year, I'm gonna see a four bushel increase. In a drought year, I'm going to see a six bushel increase. Narrow rows are going to be better. Soybean is a legume. How many grow alfalfa in rows? Does anybody grow? In, in the most abnormal thing you can do to the soybean plant is put it in a row. I, I'm even fond of drilling beans if you are so inclined. Uh, it, it just, it's, it's like corn. It, it just doesn't make any sense to make the plant compete against itself for sunlight, water, and nutrients. And the, this summer, we took some pictures. <clears throat> we went out there and we dug holes alongside of the row. And what we're looking for is the moisture line and maybe a little hard to see it. But these are 30 inch row beans and we've got beans there about every two to three inches or so down the row. And you can see all of the roots are growing in the same area and they're all sucking water out of the same area. And so our moisture line is down there at about that uh, eight inch level. And so we're really working hard on that area of the soil profile and we're really sucking a lot of water out of there. But between the rows, that moisture was still there and we couldn't tap into it with the 30 inch rows. Look at the 15 inch rows that are just five feet away. And you can see now we've got the soybeans are about every four to six inches apart. And the moisture lines at about the five and a half inch mark in 15 inch rows. And, and it's just, obvious to me as I grow them side by side to walk out there and look at it and it's just um, I, I just don't feel that it makes any sense to make the plant compete with its neighbor for sunlight water and nutrients when I was a kid we were in 40 inch row beans and we used to hill drop corn and we've come a long ways but I still think we've got room for improvement as we move to the future seeding rates love the seeding industry to death and, and, and here's uh, I used to grow beans um, for seed. I used to plant them at 200,000. used to drill them at 200,000. And then we went to 15 inch rows and we started backing down. Here's at 150,000. We're gonna see four seeds per foot of row in 15 inch rows. And you can see the tape measure there and you can see how they're spaced out. Now, if we were to plant beans at 75,000, now we're gonna have two seeds per foot of row. And one of the things I mentioned in one of my earlier sessions, you'll notice that the pods are a lot closer to the ground and there's a lot more of them. So if I'm a businessman, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna do the math calculations, I'm gonna calculate some yields, I'm gonna find out if I can get a response. So here's our long-term data, and we're gonna compare both here. We're gonna do it in a normal year, and then I'm gonna to talk to you about populations in a dry year. Long-term, five years. In the purple bar on the left, the soybeans are planted at 50,000. And then we just add 25,000 every time we move across the screen. And finally, over on the right-hand side of the screen, the green bar, we're planting beans, and this is what I see on the monitor, we're planting beans at 200,000 to the acre. But what you notice in a normal year is, number one, when we went from 50,000 to 75,000, I got a one bushel increase. And again, this is 20 replications using very similar varieties of beans uh, at, at my farm. And then we move to the yellow bar uh, at 100,000 and it just flatlines. And I, this is a variety that really doesn't respond to population. Now there are probably varieties of soybeans out there that do, but the, the work that I've done at my farm, I've yet to be able to identify any of the varieties that really respond to population. So let's do some math calculations on it here. Um, so really I, I'm gonna spend about $10 to go from the purple bar to the blue bar and I'm gonna get one bushel of beans. So really I didn't make a whole lot of money. But as I start buying seed, I just continue to lose more money and more of it. And it really is no advantage at my farm to, to planting higher populations of beans. Now I will also mention that the 200,000 mark, you're gonna run a higher risk of white mold. I think if you remember listening to Ken Ferry talk this morning, Ken and I have been buddies for a long time. And I didn't realize that he was gonna have that data in there, but his data is exactly the same information that I have on populations and row spacings. And you can see it right here, just not doing me a lot of good. Um, my maximum profitability probably comes there at 75,000. And I can tell you, I have been planting beans at my farm 
at 75,000 for about the last five years. In the first couple years that I did it, it scared the daylights out of me to only see 75,000 on the screen. But I trusted the data that I have, and still today it, it proves it's a pretty good decision. I'm also using treated beans in case we get a crust so that I don't have any trouble getting them. They will eventually come up out of the ground. Now, the uh, 50,000 thing is kind of the least amount of work. <laughs> And so what's really nice if you're planting beans at 50,000 is you can have the hired man help you fill the planter and at 50,000, hell, you can plant all day and never have to stop to reload the, the planter. But I'm still gonna, I, I, next year we're, we're still gonna be at 75,000. Now, let's, let's move on here and let's talk about 2012 and what happened during the drought for populations on beans. Again, the purple bar at 50,000 on the left side of the screen made 59 bushel beans. And all the way over to the right, at 200,000, our beans made 66 bushel to the acre. So, what that told me this year during the drought, that I left some money on the table, and I would have been better off planting higher population. I have more factories out there, more ability to suck the water out of the ground, more canopy to help shade it to keep the sun from cooking the soil and drying it out. Do the math calculations there. I would have picked up five bucks an acre at 75, uh, 10 bucks, 30 bucks, $35. And then that's kind of where it kind of flattened out. So last year, my most profitable population at my farm would have been at that 150,000 mark. So I left about $35 an acre on the table last year because I planted too thin. But again, I think over the long haul, I'm still with the varieties that I'm using going to stay at that 75,000 mark. Maximum profitability there and least amount of work. Let's talk about residue a little bit, and this is becoming an issue, and at some of the conferences that I talked at this year, some of the meteorologists have mentioned that the weather events have changed over the last 100 years, and that we're seeing heavier rainfall events earlier in the season and lower rainfall events during the summer months. So that means we're seeing bigger thunderstorms. I don't know if you guys have, or what we certainly have in our part of the country. And those bigger thunderstorms are taking our corn stalks after we no-till the beans that you can see there in the background, and they wash them down through the field, and eventually they can get over to a culvert, and they can plug the culvert, and then we start backing up water. And I've heard stories about some farmers that were sued because their corn stalks plugged the culvert, the water backed up into a housing development <clears throat> and flooded some basements. So try to keep in mind here that you know we're trying to be the perfect steward of the soil and, and not upset people, but we still have to farm at the same time. So let's talk a little bit about dealing with the corn stalk residue as we're growing beans, and then I'll open it up here to some questions. In, in corn, we looked at some sister hybrids here um, about 10 years ago. Um, it's just the one on the right has the BT genetics in the bag and the one on the left didn't. And you can see we got about a seven bushel increase by buying the BT genetics. But the other thing is the BT genetics not only give us more yield, but they give us a stronger stock and it's harder to get it to decompose and when it does start to move it has a tendency to create ugly things out there in the field. So what we're looking at is what can we do to help chew up the corn stalks Let's feed the microbes, let's feed the bacteria, let's feed the earthworms. I, I used to raise pigs, so I spent all winter feeding pigs. Today, even though I don't have any livestock, I still think I'm a livestock farmer because I have a crop of earthworms in the soil and I wanna feed those earthworms. I can tell you my earthworms can't jump this high to eat these corn stalks. And so I gotta do something to help the earthworms out a little bit and we wanna get it down on the ground. Many of you have seen this in the field um, after harvest time. Well, we found out that the problem and the reason that that happens is that if you're using a stock roll design that has overlapping or intermeshing flutes, first thing we want to do is think like the corn stalk. When it's coming into the row unit, this is what it's looking at. And number one, we can't get in between those flutes when it's not turning. So how are we ever going to get in between those flutes when they are turning. You spin that at about 800 to 1,000 RPMs a minute, it just becomes a solid wall of steel. And that's what the corn stalk's looking at, and that's why you see the bulldozer effect from the combined cab. And it starts to just push those stalks over, and our corn heads become corn pluckers, 
instead of corn pickers. So one of the things we worked on with this little concept right here of changing the length of the flutes and we create a little revolving window or a feeding chamber and or a corn slot and it's a moment in time where we shorten up the flutes and allow the corn stalk to get started. Once it's in there, now we can grab a hold of it and chew it up. So this has been one of the things that's helped us in being able to get the residue to go on through. You can see we're doing a much better job here. We're gonna shred it like celery. Um, you can see the white pith in there. It's gonna be easy for the earthworms to eat that. It's gonna be faster decomposition as well. So on my right hand side there is the before picture and over my left shoulder is the after picture. And all the differences between that photograph is the one runs a revolving window and the other one doesn't. So it has a pretty dramatic effect on being able to chew up the residue. We still can come in and no-till, but it's just, we're going to help mother nature along. I want to accelerate the decomposition. I want to accelerate my re-entry time. That corn plant is food for the next year's soybean crop. So we make a, a chopping stock roll. If you're interested, you stop by. We have it for red, we have it for yellow. And um, this is one of the things that I liked is that as you look at the, the stalk as it's coming out underneath there, not only are those pieces an inch long, but they're also sheared. And once we shear it, that's where we really make the jump to light speed in my opinion. Now the earthworm bacteria microbes are gonna be able to step in there and that stuff's gonna melt down very, very quickly and we're gonna get it back into the soil. That residue, I want it to stay at my farm. I want it to go into the soil. I want my earthworms to eat it and take it down a hole. This is what it looks like right after you run the combine through the field. We pulled the leaves and the husk back. You can see the confetti laying on the ground. And like I said, it, it'll dry out. It'll warm up next spring and we're good to go. Shredder heads, and we, we see more of these in the northern corn belt. Um, cat makes them, deer makes them, case makes them. Uh, we took this at the Nebraska Farm Show. If you take a close-up view though, we shredded the corn stalk, but you can see a long chunk there, green chunk of uh, stalk, and it's just cut off. But it's really not chewed up or anything. And so it's still gonna take a fair amount of time to get that four inch piece of stalk to decompose. The other thing that you'll notice is with the lawnmower blades down underneath, they have a tendency to want to windrow it's like, running, it's like running a lawnmower through the field. It's going to windrow things off to one side. And if we pile that up from a no-tiller's point of view, then it's going to be colder, going to be wetter. It's going to take longer to dry it out. And it's going to be difficult to get the soybeans to, to grow underneath there. So if you do buy a shredder head or you are doing some of this after harvest events, make sure that you get a nice even distribution of the residue. Also, when you cut your soybeans, um, take the time to work with the spreading part of the machine, whether it's red, green, or yellow. Uh, our particular combine has the two spinners on the back. We can adjust the fins on those spinners and we can widen the flow and the, the throw uh, when I'm cutting beans and then I can switch sides and that gives me a real narrow throw for when I'm combining corn. So if you're gonna cut 30 feet, I hope you'll spend time with your combine to get it to spread 30 feet. And the other thing you'll notice here is that I have a chaff spreader underneath. Always been kind of disappointed with this machine's ability to spread chaff. And so I put a chaff spreader on it even though the spinners are supposed to do that for me. And I really like the chaff spreader down there underneath and I can spread the chaff 20 to 25 feet. But I really want to spread that straw 30 feet out the back there. Our part of the country, um, after soybean harvest is over, we're starting to see a lot of people that are doing what I would call a scratch and plant system to make no-till corn work the following year. Um, uh, the Great Plains turbo-till has been one. Uh, we are allowed to put anhydrous on, but you can see how quickly that soybean residue starts to melt down. Soybeans are our most erosive crop in the United States. Need to protect that residue and um, keep it out there. Starting to learn a little bit about cover crops. I just talked a couple weeks ago in Pennsylvania. Cover crops are big out there. And I tell them I'm so doggone busy at harvest time, I don't have time to come in and run the drill. But they said, you know what, drill it anyway. And they're, they're firm believers in cover crops and uh, I hope to work with it more in the future. But give that some thought as you move into the future years of something that you might be able to add 
to your operation is some cover crops over the winter months. So breaking the yield barriers at my farm involved these five items. No tilling has helped me move to the next level. Can't say that I've made a lot of progress, but it certainly has been an asset instead of a liability. I'm also seeing good things out of dry fertilizer, but I still got room to improve. Get the right mix, the right amount of phosphorus, potassium, whatever it is, might be. But make sure that you know what your dry fertilizer is doing. Don't just blindly spread it and think that it's, you know what, um, you all know what assume means? <laughs> you know, it makes a, out of you and me. And, and so I've stopped assuming at my farm and I've started tracking to see what's going on. And with our new auto steer systems and our auto guidance systems, um, we, we now have the ability to do a variety tracker and a hybrid tracker. And, and you can set up your planner to do some on-farm research and you don't even have to get out of the cab and the combine will come back and give you those numbers at harvest time. Narrow rows, I just don't see it. One of the easiest ways, and this is one of the steps to better thinking, one of the easiest ways to make the mind understand and problem solve is to exaggerate. And for many years, I grew beans in 45 inch rows because I had a 15 inch planter. I grew beans in 45 inch rows. And you stand out there and you look at those 45 inch beans and it's just like, this doesn't make any sense at all. And it doesn't. And if you can solid seed them, um, better erosion, better weed control, better yield. Seeding rates, I'm sure there's some varieties out there that will respond to population. The ones I'm looking at don't have a big response to it. But I tell you, the, the people have just slowly been backing off on populations, and I would encourage you to take a look at it in the future. Last but not least, residue management. As we move into the future and we grow bigger corn yields and bigger soybean yields and we produce more fodder, more biomass out there, we've got to learn to deal with it. And, and at my farm, it means getting it back into the soil. It's an asset, not a liability, and I want to get it back into the soil. How am I doing on time? I got a Couple minutes for a few questions. Hopefully there are some students. Do you have some students running around out there with microphones or holler them out? You've got one. <laughs> okay. Well, if you've got some questions, holler them out. We'd be more than happy. I suppose I've got uh, five minutes, maybe. Twenty minutes. Oh, twenty minutes. Oh gosh. We've got twenty minutes, but we've got a Yes. Yeah, Sorry. Have you done work with foliar feeding? Good question, Dan. Um, I have not at this point in time. Um, the issues that I have is is being able, on a research point of view, is um, I've got to set up some tram lines and I got to get my wheel traffic in those tram lines so I can spray 20 feet with foliar and not with 20 feet. But it's a very good point. And um, I, I wish I was a little further down the line. That's going to be something we're going to work on. But it's got to be done with a, with a ground applicator in, in order to be able to research it. Good point. You said planter is the most important piece of equipment that's on the farm. Have you done anything with row, not row spacing, um, but drop and how far the drop was as one far seat from one seed to the next? And if it has any impact? Um, uniform seed spacing. Yep. Yeah, is, is when we're in 30 inch rows or 40 inch rows, seed spacing is a huge issue. Um, and if we get more than a 10 to 15% deviation in seed space, oh, it's gonna have a negative effect on yield. One of the advantages of going to narrower rows in beans or in corn is that we start to get those plants further apart from each other. And Therefore, the seed spacing doesn't seem to be as much of an influence. And that's one of the things we're looking at in the corn thing is um, if you're in a 12 inch row and you have a 14 inch seed space, if you measure from that plant, it's always 14 inches diagonally over to the next row. And that's what's called pure equal plant spacings. Now, if we go to 10 inch road beans with a 10 inch seed space, that'd put us at 60,000, that's maybe a little light. In corn, that's probably pretty heavy. But you start to get the idea of solid seeded crops. Our, our front yards are not in rows. Our pastures are not in rows. Our hay fields are not in rows. And as we grow crops in America here, um, 
I, I think we need to focus on, on the solid seated concept that South America is quite a ways ahead of us on row spacings. But good point. Anybody else have a question they want to ask? Marion, thank you so much. Marion Calmer is. Thank uh, you. Um, are you